Good morning, uh, everybody. So my name is Philippe Sussu, and uh, today I'm going to talk about uh, recent work we have done in collaboration with uh, Lubna El Gedari, Emily Shudu, and John Christophe Pesquet, entitled "Online MRI Reconstruction for Compass Sensing Acquisition in T2 Star Rated Imaging, and especially in the context of High Resolution Imaging." So here is the outline of my talk. So. Uh, in the first part, uh, I will briefly give you uh, um, main information, the context and motivation for uh, online reconstruction and complex sensing. And then I will be presenting uh, what makes the difference between a classical image reconstruction in the single channel call setting and in the multi channel call setting. And, uh, and then we will see how to use uh, the kind of uh, calibration less reconstruction. Uh, um, we have developed in the second part. We're going to see how to uh, to implement that in the context of online reconstruction in the third parts, and then I will give you some conclusion. So let's start with the context. So the first question we, we we would like to address is how to get high resolution imaging, and the very critical ingredients uh, to achieve a resolution is to get a high signal to noise ratio. And in MRI, um, to obtain a high signal, signal to noise ratio, you have several ingredients, but the most basic one is, of course, uh, the field strength of your static magnetic field. So here you have some pictures of the three scanners, three clinical scanners installed at Neurospin at three Tesla, seven Tesla, and 11.7 Tesla, the future um, strongest magnets uh, all over the world. And basically, the signal to noise ratio is proportional uh, to the intensity of this uh, field strength uh, as a denote to the power of 1.65. And it's particularly suited for the kind of uh, weighted imaging we are interested in, the T2 star rated imaging, because this gives you, um, this gives us some um, new uh, biomarker or clinical uh, um, measurements uh, f that are really interested, uh, interesting for diagnosis. So here is an example of um, the impact of increasing the B node field uh, on the SNR and on the image quality. So for the same uh, individual, we collected images. Uh, it's, it's, it's paper from uh, a literature uh, the authors collected images at 1.5 Tesla, 3 Tesla, and 7 Tesla. And of course, in the particular point uh, um, with the right arrow, you can't see really any details at 1.5 or 3 Tesla, whereas you can delineate a clear uh, tumor, for instance, in the subcortical areas. So really um, getting to higher magnetic fields matters when uh, you are interested in clinical uh, diagnosis. And that's the main reason for which uh, in 2017, uh, the FDA, uh, the seven Tesla machines have been FDA cleared and CE marked uh, on the market. So um, beyond uh, increasing uh, the, the magnetic field, you can also uh, use different uh, uh, hardwares or different um, uh, coils, actually. Uh, the coil is a, is a set, uh, is the equipment represented in, in red uh, around the head uh, in these uh, pictures. And uh, what matters in the definition of a coil is actually the number of elements, the number of uh, red uh, circle, uh, red rectangles. And uh, the larger uh, this number is, the better the signal to noise ratio is as well. This is just because uh, uh, you diminish the noise level when the dimension of these elements uh, is reduced. And so here in, is an illustration of the typical images you can get from the different channels, so the different elements of this phase the record. And as you can see, you basically see the same structure, the same object, but, but with different illumination. This is what is called the sensitivity of each, each channels. And we'll get back to this concept uh, later on. 
So now it's also just an illustration of the impact of moving from a single channel call to a multiple channel call on the image quality. So on the left hand side, this was a baboon brain collected ex vivo at 70 with a single channel call and the same object, the same brain on the right hand side with a multi channel call with 32 receiver. And you can clearly see that the noise level has been tremendously uh, removed. So now in terms of brain imaging and in vivo imaging, right now the best resolution you can uh, reach hopefully is around 100 and 200 micrometer uh, in plane. But uh, so this can be done at 70 using uh, multiple receiver channel coil and with uh, uh, a very long acquisition time. And of course, also at the expense of uh, a thicker slices in the sense that this resolution is not isotropic in the three direction. And uh, considering thicker uh, slices allows you to get also a better signal to noise ratio because the SNR in the end is proportional to the vo volume of the voxel size. And just this kind of images, uh, which, was, which, which covered uh, pretty well uh, the brain uh, in the X and Y axis, uh, you can realize that we only covered a very little part of the brain along the Z axis. So even for this kind of acquisition, it took about 15 minutes. So the question we want to ask is how to, we can speed up this acquisition. And to answer uh, properly this question, I need to, to give you a few information regarding how the data is collected in MRI. So in MRI, the acquisition is not performed in the image space, but instead in the Fourier space, what is called K space in the, in the field. And usually, uh, traditionally, along Cartesian lines, so on the grid. And just the reconstruction is, uh, is obtained uh, by a simple inverse Fourier transform. This is a really a, a toys model, uh, I would say. And of course, uh, this uh, K space, so in the center you have the zero frequency, um, and uh, the, the size of the K space depends on the resolutions you want to target, you want to, to reach. So the higher the resolution, the higher this, this square, so the longer the acquisition time will be. And if you want, if you want to, uh, to speed up the acquisition, you need to collect less measurements. And for that reason, you can be interested, for instance, in collecting only the center of K-space. And if you do that, of course, you preserve the contrast, but at the expense of the detail in the image. In contrast, if you only collect the outer parts of the K-space, you preserve pretty well the details, but not the contrast. And of course, if you subsample, for instance, um, one line out of the two uh, along a certain direction, which is called the phase encoding direction, you end up with some well-known aliasing artifacts. And why is this? Just because you, you don't fulfill uh, the, the Shannon increase theorem, uh, which tells you that you would need to sample at least uh, at the frequency of twice the highest frequency contained in the signal. So, in MRI, we actually don't. We actually collect the data in the case space and not in, in the temporal or image domain. So, subsampling in this direction just means that uh, we we can reconstruct a field of view which is only the half of the true field of view, and that's why we observe this aliasing in the direction where you subsample the data. So this is the. Uh, so this kind of uh, limitation uh, can be uh, overcome using parallel imaging techniques, and they have been they have known a real success over the last uh, twenty years. But in this presentation, I won't go uh, into parallel imaging techniques, but instead in the compressed sensing approach. And so the compressed sensing has been introduced in two thousand seven in the field uh, by Blustick and Polly. And basically, uh, as we will see later on, it relies on three ingredients, uh, subsampling in the case space, uh, a nonlinear reconstruction, and also some hypothesis on the sparsity of images. Uh, 
And let's go into detail about that. So uh, when introduced uh, initially by Candace, uh, Romberg and Tao on one hand and uh, Dono on the other hand. So the idea of compressed sensing was of course to, to promote the sparsity of the image uh, to be reconstructed or the, or the signal to be restored uh, in an appropriate representation. And for, for the images, uh, one of the best or more appropriate representation is the wavelet decomposition, for instance, because uh, this kind of, oops, sorry, this kind of images uh, can be wavelet transformed and uh, the subband corresponding to the uh, vertical, uh, uh, horizontal and diagonal details contain only a, non a few non-zero coefficients. So this can be sp pretty well approximated by a sparse uh, decomposition. So the second key ingredient in the theory of compressed sensing is uh, the, the notion of incoherence. And uh, in the seminal paper by Condes and colleagues, uh, they clearly uh, illustrate this notion, for instance, between the, the Fourier and, uh, and the temporal domain, and of course, a perfect um, peak in the Fourier domain, uh, which is a sparsifying domain, is well represented uh, by a sine wave, so it occupies a whole space in the temporal domain. But if you try to apply this kind of notion to MRI, this fails. The reason is because um, you don't have uh, incoherence between uh, the, the wavelet domain and the Fourier domain, so between the sparsifying domain and the acquisition domain. And why is this? Just because um, the, if you pick up uh, an atom in the sparsifying domain and you try to, to see how it, how it is spread in the acquisition domain, you will immediately realize that it is, it is localized in the low frequency uh, in, in the low frequencies. So, which means that if you don't sample these kind of frequencies, you, you have no chance to perfectly recover uh, the, ima the original image. For that reason, the, the concept of local coherence has been introduced says, instead of global coherence. And this notion, so it's just the same sum over the different atoms of, um, I would say, the uh, the Hay matrix, which is a product of Fourier on, on, on inverse wavelet or adjoint wavelet. And um, the idea is to try to, to, to minimize the local coherence. And if you try to do that by, for instance, designing a something a density, a something distribution that conserve, that keeps uh, intact the, um, the low frequency and discard any high frequency, then you will be able to minimize the number of measurements m that you will need to perfectly recover your image x uh, just by equating this inequality. So here, uh, n is the number of pixels in your image and s is a specific, the number of non-zero coefficients in your uh, decomposition. So for that reason, uh, variable density something uh, has been shown to be a key ingredient for the implementation of compressed sensing in MRI. But variable density sampling only tells you what should be, what could be a, a good a sampling distribution, but it doesn't tell you how uh, to collect these measurements. And in MRI, we have a very strict constraint is that the measurements are not co collected pointwise or one at a time, but oh, pointwise, I, I would say but along trajectories, along curves. So here you have an illustration of a radial sampling and here an illustration of a competitor, which is called sparkling. It's one of the, um, uh, of the techniques we have proposed, uh, we have implemented and proposed to the field recently. And uh, as you can see, so both are viable density, but not very exactly the same uh, density. And this one, uh, Philips, fills up um, much more precisely the case space compared to that one. And if you try to compare them, uh, for instance, regarding the, the metric of the point spread function, which uh, is basically the inverse uh, Fourier transform for your sampling uh, pattern, you can immediately see that the sparkling one is better 
uh, because uh, it's PSF, it's more picky in the center with no streaking artifact in the background. Of course, and the third ingredient uh, in CS is, uh, of course, a nonlinear sparsity promoting reconstruction, and which basically uh, can be addressed either uh, in a constrained form or in a penalized form, as we retain uh, here, uh, where you try to minimize a, a, a criterion composed of a data consistency term between your measurements y over uh, the support of the sampling pattern omega s uh, and the, the distance between the Fourier transform of your image you want to recover, plus um, sparse uh, regularizer, typically the L1 norm, of uh, sparse decomposition of your original image. And here is a typical way of uh, approaching uh, CS uh, in practice. So it's first you collect the data. Uh, and as you can see, because we are in the, in the context of morphological imaging, uh, the data are segmented in time. Sorry, the data are segmented in time. So they are collected one shot at a time. And once all data has been collected, then you perform image reconstruction. So in the rest of the talk, we will see uh, uh, how to go beyond uh, this, um, this approach. But just to illustrate uh, the impact of these two sampling patterns on image quality, because uh, also uh, later on, we will retain the sparkling uh, scheme as uh, uh, our um, best acquisition scenario uh, for illustrating a line reconstruction. So here's a typical acquisition we did uh, on the 70 on an in vivo healthy subject. subject. So this is a reference Cartesian uh, image. So in, a, in a, an acquisition time on four minutes and 42 seconds, we collected 11 slices. So I show you only one here. Um, so with uh, this kind of really good, uh, good details. And in contrast, we accelerated uh, by a factor of 20, um, the acquisition using either uh, the sparkling in outs uh, trajectories or the radial one. And as you can see, uh, the sparkling one performs uh, far better compared to the radial one. But of course, uh, this kind of uh, imaging is non-Cartesian, so which means that you, are, you sample half, half the grid and so you no longer use uh, FFT, but instead the non-uniform FFT and so on, which means that basically um, the reconstruction of a given slice takes between one and two minutes. And so, and as you know, a 3D volume, a 3D scans typically consist of uh, uh, 200 slices um, or at least 100 uh, if you consider um, seeker slices. So, um, it might took a very uh, a long time to get uh, the whole volume uh, reconstructed. So that's the problem we want to address in the, in the rest of the talk. So, but before uh, defining precisely uh, the online uh, reconstruction setting, uh, I would like to uh, insist on uh, how to reconstruct images uh, when you collect the data over uh, coiled, composed of uh, multiple channels. So in this domain, there are basically uh, two categories of methods. The first one uh, is called self-calibrated reconstruction. Uh, I will just give you a, a, a few words about that. Uh, um, and then the second category is calibrationless reconstruction. So in the first category, you reconstruct a single image. In uh, the second category, you reconstruct um, as many images as the number of channels in your coil. So let's talk briefly uh, uh, about the first category. So the idea here is just uh, to consider um, the design of your coil. So here is an illustration with a coil with four elements. And as you can see uh, on the graph at the bottom of the slides, uh, each element has a particular uh, sensitivity profile, which means that each element is sensitive, more sensitive to a particular um, location of the object of interest. And you want, to, of course, to combine all of them to recover a high quality image 
over the whole field of view. And this is why uh, in the minimization in the cost function we want to minimize, we actually uh, accumulate the data over all channels through this uh, modified uh, data consistency term. So we, we, we summarize, we, we sum over the channels here, here the L index um, range over channels. And in, we have this sensitivity map for each channel SL that reflects this sensitivity profile shown below. And the rest is remains uh, the same as before. And of course, uh, to be able to perform reconstruction, we need to know these SL matrices. And uh, the, so we need to know the, um, the SL matrices, which means that we mean we need to estimate them or to extract them for, for, from the data. So typically, um, typically the coil sensitivity profiles are, are subject and scan dependent because um, the profile of the sensitivity depends on the distance between uh, the brain and, uh, um, and, the, and the channel and the coil. And so this is repeated. This is a, a repeated procedure for each scan. And so between the two uh, strategies, uh, if you if you try to estimate the sensitivity profile before your scan of interest, uh, you can, for instance, uh, use a separate uh, acquisition. But of course, uh, the immediate consequence is to extend the duration of uh, the whole exam. Um, and uh, the alternative is to try to extract uh, in the reconstruction process uh, the sensitivity information because it's a low resolution information. So using VDS, variable density sample acquisition, it's doable, but uh, it's still uh, at the expense of the reconstruction time. And this cannot really be done in the online setting because uh, Online setting means that you want to be able to reconstruct uh, a new image as soon as new data is coming up. So for that reason, in, in the rest of the presentation, we will focus on calibration less reconstruction, in a, uh, which is a setting in which you no longer need knowledge of code sensitivity profiles and um, to compensate for this lack of information, we will exploit redundancy across channel and try to impose structure sparsity. So let's uh, have a look on this formulation. So here, uh, the cost function we want to minimize is actually a matrix extension of the previous one in which capital X is just accumulating um, all images uh, we want to reconstruct per, across all channels. Um, and the Y corresponds to the whole data sets uh, we collected over uh, all channels as well. Um, <clears throat> and Psi re remains the same as sparsifying transform as before. And now we're going to see how to choose R uh, to be uh, to regularize this inverse problem. So in terms of optimization, uh, here is um, the, the, the framework we retain for minimizing this cost function. So uh, because um, how our, so we use the primal draw uh, optimization approach because how our data consistency term F is convex, differentiable, and gradient deep sheets, uh, we can apply this. And also because R uh, the penalty term uh, would be chosen with a closed form, uh, typically proximity operator given by a formula by equation five. So these approaches are of course standard in uh, non-smooth optimization, non-smooth convex optimization. And uh, we could also use uh, alternatives uh, formulation, but we selected this one because we used the uh, uh, an analysis formulation in which the linear operator is encapsulated within the regularizing term. 
And in terms of algorithm, we used uh, the Conda View algorithm. Um, we where we uh, so we typically have initialization of the primal variable. So in the image domain, the draw variable, um, in the wavelet domain Z, and uh, an iteration like this where you have the uh, gradient step uh, over the primal variable uh, plus a correcting term depending on the draw and uh, the adjoint of the side transform. Uh, an updating uh, between the an update rule between the two terms and the dual step uh, involving the proximity operator of G. And this algorithm is known to converge at least weekly if this inequality is fulfilled. And in practice, we set the to and kappa parameter as follow just to be at the equality uh, boundary of this uh, constraint. So now let's have a look on which kind of uh, regularization we used. Uh, first, uh, we tried to implement so this idea of uh, structure sparsity uh, across all channels by um, so promoting uh, the idea of getting the same uh, support in the wavelet domain uh, across all channels. So typically applying Psi uh, to this imaging and trying to uh, uh, to promote uh, the structure sparsity, meaning that either we preserve the same information across all channels or we discard it uh, for all as well. And so this can be implemented using, for instance, a group lasso, which basically um, sum over, it's a sum of L2 norms, so it's a, uh, over groups, and here the groups are defined just by uh, a given uh, pixel, a given location, in uh, the wavelet domain. And so G is a set of groups defining the partition of Z. And basically here, uh, it's a mixed norm. So it's a L1 norm over, uh, over all the groups, which are defined as the L2 norm over the channels for a given location. So in practice, uh, lambda remains a CI per parameter to, to be set. Uh, so we did for that, uh, we used them um, a grid search. Uh, interestingly, group lasso, it has been shown uh, in the literature uh, uh, as, well, as well by Chen and colleagues that uh, this kind of um, regularization provides tighter recovery guarantees uh, in the context of uh, parallel acquisition, which means that uh, we, we can have a look at the concentration inequalities relating the number of measurements and uh, the, sparsif the sparsity uh, of the images and show that we can divide uh, the number of measurements by the fa by the number of channels and still maintain exact recovery guarantees. So this was a way of imposing structure sparsity using the L2 norm, but we also uh, investigated uh, other approaches. For instance, uh, using the OSCAR regularization, which is a, a compromise between L1 norm and pairwise n infinity norm. So of course, the L1 norm still promotes uh, the sparsity, but these terms tends to make these two candidates, these two uh, uh, pixels uh, very close to each other. So it has been uh, uh, used uh, in, the, in the context of uh, clustering. And uh, it's tightly related as well to the ordered weighted uh, L1 norm. So um, of course, to implement this in practice, you need to perform a, a quick sort of your correct efficient uh, before um, before computing the the penalization. Interestingly, uh, Oscar has an explicit proximity operator. Uh, also, it's more computationally demanding compared to the group lasso. So here's an illustration of the effect of this. Uh, uh, Oscar regularization on the uh, on the unit ball, so you can see that this clustering effect uh, on the poles. Um, so to validate this kind of uh, approach uh, for regularization, we use uh, this experimental setup. So the same uh, as the one I showed you before, except that this was an ex vivo human brain instead of uh, um, a baboon brain. 
So high resolution imaging um, with this kind of resolution, uh, etc. And uh, we compare the different approaches. So L1 spirit is a state of the art approach, uh, which is called it's a self calibrated approach. So in which you exploit the, the knowledge of the sensitivity uh, profiles. And uh, PILORAX is is another uh, calibration less technique that didn't work pretty well. And the three we propose, good place to uh, Oscar or K support norm, which is uh, another way of imposing structure sparsity, but with um, um, overlapping uh, groups, for instance. Uh, so they perform pretty well uh, in a pretty similar way. And it's shown here uh, visually. So the reference image on the top left, the L1 spirit here, the pylorax, which is more noisy in the center of the brain. And the three candidates we propose are really uh, similar and very uh, close to the reference. And uh, the di image difference, to see the difference, we can only see uh, pretty well that the pylorax perform worse compared to the other, but that's these uh, three candidates for um, calibration less reconstruction provides very um, competitive results uh, compared to the self-calibrated one at one spirit. This is a key message here. Okay, so so we have seen how to impose structure sparsity uh, for calibration less reconstruction. And now the question is how we can speed up this reconstruction. So let's move to the last part of the presentation. So before I go into detail, so uh, I would like to insist on the acquisition aspect. So the motivation for doing uh, online reconstruction is uh, will be clearer uh, in just a couple of seconds, just by analyzing the chronogram, the chronogram of the sequence. So this is a pulse sequence uh, in MRI, so the radio frequency pulse is delivered. And then you have the set of gradients, so how to select the slice, and then how to encode the space using phase encoding and uh, frequency encoding and phase encoding, and just collecting the data, uh, which was is called a read uh, readout. So when you open the analog to digital converter, and of course, what is really important is that in this kind of acquisition, you have a dead time between two consecutive radio frequency pulses. And the reason is that you need to, to spend some time to, to make the spins, uh, to allow the spins to re recover um, their initial state, their equilibrium state. And this time can be, for instance, a few hundreds of milliseconds. And the idea uh, of online reconstruction uh, will be to interleave in this in this uh, dead time, some reconstruction. So just interleave acquisition and reconstruction. And so for for doing so, uh, just to explain the the framework, uh, let's start with um, uh, uh, the the case of the single uh, channel acquisition. So as you can see in this uh, picture, so the acquisition is divided in shots. This is a multi-shot, and each shot is denoted by a gamma high uh, that collects uh, data along the trajectories, uh, typically C measurements. But now uh, let's denote um, small omega k, uh, a set of um, shots that will be uh, a set uh, of, uh, of shots, so with a number of BS shots in this set, uh, that will be added to what we call the uh, mini batch number K, uh, defined as follows, so uh, just as a uh, union of um, the uh, small omega high. Uh, so the idea is to, uh, to, to gather or to put together uh, a number of shots to perform partial image reconstruction. So once you have collected BS charts, um, you, 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 you launch a preliminary reconstruction. And then uh, in the meantime, uh, you collect uh, a new set of BS charts and that you accumulate with a previous run to update your initial solution and get a, a, another one. 
So of course, so this is uh, the new formulation. You just have to to make sure that uh, the problem that you partially solve in the end will converge to your um, uh, final solution to the offline reconstruction problem. That's why we have this uh, normalizing term here. The other key important aspect is the online constraints. So what we really want to uh, um, to stick to stick to is to impose that um, the reconstruction time basically on the left hand side is equivalent to the acquisition time. So TR is the time of repetition. So uh, the, the timing separating two acquisition and BS is the number of shots that you will consider uh, together. So basically, this gives you the acquisition time for BS shots. And on the left hand side, it's a reconstruction time. So the time per iteration times the number of iteration. <clears throat> so here is the, how we uh, extended the Condavu algorithm to the online context. So just first, we are still the primal variable, the draw variable. And then uh, we will iterate uh, we have an external loop over the shots or the mini uh, the mini batches. Sorry, we have a primal gradient step, a dual pro proximal step as well, and then the classical Condavi sequence uh, applied to each uh, mini batch, and finally a warm restart just to update uh, the solution for a given mini batch um, as the initialization to the next one. And uh, in the end, we concatenate batches. So we use the similar uh, experimental setup as before. And then, uh, of course, check the consistency of this constraint given um, the time per, the time per, per iteration, sorry, the value of the repetition time here, uh, 550 uh, uh, milliseconds. And uh, we analyze the time per iteration. And based on the, these quantities, we were able to investigate different settings for the number of shots, BS, and different value for the number of iteration of, for reconstruction uh, for each mini, mini patch. So, and we use this kind of uh, settings for the regularization. And here, uh, what I'm showing is uh, the evolution of the cost function. Uh, over the mini batches with different settings of uh, the mini batch size. So BS equal one in, in dash line, BS equal two in, in red uh, uh, full line, uh, and so on. And as you can see, of course, all choices converge uh, to the final, uh, to, the, to the same value. Uh, and in parallel, uh, we, you can see on the right hand side the evolution of the SSIM score. And of course, uh, because with small batch size, uh, you update more frequently uh, the, the cost and, and the image, you can reach actually just by the end of the acquisition, which is represented by this uh, vertical dotted line, uh, the optimal SSEM value, um, more fa faster than considering longer shots, longer batch size. So typically, uh, we show here that um, the smaller the mini batch size, uh, the sooner you will get uh, the final image. And this is an illustration of uh, how it works. So, uh, with the uh, evolution of two, uh, a mini batch size of two, or of one, for, sorry. So, we update here uh, the image after each uh, shots collected. So this was this worked pretty well for the single channel coil, but now, uh, of course, we want to extend this approach to the multi-channel uh, coil. And as I told you before, so self-calibrating reconstruction methods are not really appealing for online reconstruction because they require the knowledge of the coil sensitivity map, and also because of another reason that uh, I didn't disclose so far is that the gradient lip the Lipschitz constants in the gradient term actually depends on the sensitivity profile as well. So you will have to update the computation of the Lipschitz constants uh, for each new mini batch or each. Uh, yeah. So 
<clears throat> it's, it's, so it's, it's naturally uh, appealing. So in, in contrast, the Lipschitz constants for calibration less only depends on sampling pattern. So it's more appealing and more appropriate for this kind of uh, online reconstruction. And so we use the same framework as, as before. I extend that, of course, we, we consider um, partial reconstruction with uh, uh, omega k defined uh, for a mini batch. And in this case, we, we use the uh, OSCAR regularization applied to different uh, sub-bond of your uh, wavelet decomposition. And so we apply this here. You have the summation of a scale, the summation of a bonds, and we put together all uh, wavelet coefficients, um, all, all wavelet coefficients of the detailed sub bounds, uh, and multiplied by the number of channels. So, and we, we used uh, the Oscar regularization to just promote the structure sparsity. So we use the same uh, validation framework as before. And here, of course, we examine the constraints once again, because the time per iteration uh, is of, gets um, higher, uh, given the computation of uh, the regularizing term and so on. So for that reason, given this pretty huge, pretty significant uh, timing, uh, we were limited in the number of um, Bad, uh, of batch size we can uh, specify, so only 17 or 34 um, shots taken together. And of course, this limits as well the number of iteration we can uh, perform uh, for minimizing, uh, for reconstructing uh, the image uh, at a given mini batch. And, and this is exactly what this uh, graph shows is that uh, in a single iteration, we didn't have time to really converge. So um, this was not uh, here. The, the vertical <coughs> line indicates represents the end of the acquisition. The, this is clearly an illustration that um, just applying the tools like this uh, was not efficient enough to converge. Uh, to a satisfactory image, which is represented uh, on the right hand side. So that's why we decided to analyze uh, the computational cost per iteration. And uh, between the data consistency term and the regularizing term. And what we observe is that over the first 25 or 30 iteration, um, the data fidelity term um, was the dominant term in the minimization compared to the, the, the penalty term. And uh, this is also represented by this ratio. So from 100% to 50%, uh, and you have the crossing here between the two terms. So for that reason, and also because we analyze uh, the computation cost related to each of these terms, um, and we, we realize that the cost of the data consistency term is much cheaper compared to the cost of the regularizing term, which corresponds to to some uh, the proximity operation steps, uh, the application of the linear operator, and so on. So that's why we decided to um, to adopt um, a different strategy, meaning that in the First iteration, we would start by minimizing only the smooth term. And then once we will have iterated uh, sufficiently, we will add to the cost function um, the regularizing term. And so we modify the algorithm accordingly uh, and applying uh, just a gradient step over uh, all the mini batches. And then at the end of all mini batch, we just introduced um, the regularizing term to update the solution using uh, conventional uh, Condavi formulation. And this is what we observed here now um, using this, uh, what we call the online trick. So if we minimize only the data fidelity term, so we can reduce the computation cost and thus consider mini batch size um, composed of only two shots. 
and this is enough to, iter to iterate more uh, during the reconstruction of this mini batch and to reach uh, a point in your cost function that is not optimal but very closer uh, to the minimum. And here, the bump you observe is only due to, the, to adding the regularizing term for the final minimization. And of course, afterwards, you converge to the true solution. So the final, so the final solution, sorry, um, given by uh, the first approach was this one. And <coughs> by the one using the online trick was that one. Of course, this is only an intermediate solution. It's not perfect but it's much better. And once converged, you of course recover um, an image which, which is very close to the original one. Even so, some details are not fully preserved because they are a little bit smooth out, uh, to be honest. Okay, so uh, let's summarize these parts. So we have proposed an online reconstruction framework for 2D more reconstruction and a calibrationless version makes this framework compatible with the multi-channel acquisition and reconstruction. Small batches allow to achieve high image quality um, by the end of the acquisition. And uh, of course, the bigger your computational resources, especially uh, uh, your GPU board, the better the image quality will be. And now, interestingly, all these tools are available uh, online in a very uh, open source manner because uh, we have developed in the context of this cosmic project I led uh, for three years. So at CEA with uh, my students, my collaborators, and also uh, the team led by Jean-Luc Stark at Cosmos Stat Lab. Uh, we have developed together um, a Python uh, package dedicated to image reconstruction, which is called PySAP for Python sparse data analysis package. And um, we have a specific plugin uh, for each imaging technique and one, of course, for MRI, but also others for electron tomography or astrophysics and so on. And this software um, um, actually is uh, uh, monitored using unit tests and continuous integration. And we have also a specific repository for tutorials that I'm going to use for the teaching uh, at the master level this year. Uh, and so on. No, conclude. So in this talk, so I, I, I've proposed a provably convergent online reconstruction framework that implemented a mini batch formulation to uh, interleave acquisition and reconstruction and try to get a good image quality by the end of the acquisition. The ultimate goal being that if you need to detect, for instance, uh, any motion uh, from the subject, uh, that you that you can't correct for directly, so you can just repeat the scan to avoid uh, um, losing the data. And we have uh, implemented uh, proposed uh, several uh, algorithmic accelerations. So of course, uh, we have developed, for instance, a specific uh, non-uniform FFT operator on GPU. It's, it's also available on GitHub uh, freely. We have used uh, warm restart uh, techniques. Uh, the online trick I talked to you about uh, for the parallel imaging reconstruction. And for 3D imaging, it's very recent uh, contribution uh, that I didn't talk about, but uh, we have implemented density compensation. Uh, just to, to say a word about that, density compensation is because we, we perform variable density sampling, so we, we collect much more me measurements in low frequency compared to a higher frequency, and we just want to, to compensate for that in the data consistency term, and it's like a preconditioner uh, in the computation of the gradient, and it speed up um, the reconstruction uh, really strongly. And so, um, yeah, so I would like to, to stop here and to thank you for your attention.